Indian democracy has never been perfect, but the subcontinent we inhabit has not been one of political stability. Bangladesh was formed through force and outside intervention. Sri Lanka had been facing a civil war till as recently as 2009 and continues to suffer its after effects. Pakistan has had so many military coups that you're never sure whether the next transfer of power will be peaceful. Compared to these situations, India seems to be fairly stable. But what if you were to discover that an Indian coup has already happened, not with the army, tanks and firepower, but carefully, methodically, silently. This is episode 2 of Aditya Learns to Read and I, Aditya, review Josie Joseph's book, The Silent Coup. Before I begin my review of this book, I need to set the context right. The Silent Coup is a book by the investigative journalist Josie Joseph. He has put decades of work into this book and his other investigative work, so I'm really not qualified to be critically judging the book for its journalistic efforts or for its facts or any of that. I'm taking all of this at face value and I think there is good reason for that because everything in this book has been cited with either news articles, police reports or court judgments. Another very good reason to take the facts that this book presents at face value is because the claims that the book makes are again some of the most powerful people in this country across party lines. In fact, while reading this book, I was seriously thrown into a massive bout of pessimism about my own country. Because when you read it, you realize that it is not one political party or the other who is responsible for the failure of democracy in India at so many levels. It has been a combined effort. It has been an effort of the system, by the system. And that is something that really strikes you on every page of this book. On its cover page, The Silent Coup describes itself as a history of India's deep state. And it does so by dividing the book into two parts. The two parts are 1. A Tale of Mumbai and 2. Many Tales of India. Part 1 focuses on the excesses and tortures made by the Mumbai police in response to the many terror attacks that occurred in the city in the first decade of the 21st century. And to be more specific, the story of a school teacher named Wahid who is repeatedly arrested and tortured by the Mumbai police. When you read this book, and I highly recommend that you do, you will understand exactly why Josie Joseph has chosen to dedicate half of this book to one specific case of torture and injustice. It is a perfect example of how warped and criminal the Indian security establishment can be when they want to be. Wahid's unfortunate relationship with the Mumbai police began a few days after the 9-11 attacks in New York. He was picked up by the Mumbai police on the tip of an informant. This informant claimed that Wahid was a member of the banned organization Simi. Without any proof, the Mumbai police kidnapped Wahid and kept him illegally confined in one of their many torture chambers across the city. All of this happened due to a tip given to the Mumbai police by a dubious informant who had personal scores, as it later turned out, to settle with Wahid. This business about the informants was a revelation for me on multiple levels. First of all, if any of y'all have been lucky or unlucky to grow up with Bollywood in 90s and early 2000s, you will know that informants played a massive part in the whole gangster film or police drama genre. I specifically recall a moment in the Amir Khan film Sarfarosh. Hear me out. In the film, we are shown a bunch of different kinds of informants, some who pretend to be vagrants on the streets and get information from gangsters, or even women who work in dance bars who act as informants for the police in return for money or some kind of protection. Now, in the film, the righteous cop goes and gets this information from these informants and they help the police in removing this corrosive gangster element from society. However, this book paints a very different picture of informants. While informants might be a very valid part of any kind of crime fighting that the police might be engaged in, Josie Joseph presents an argument that this police informant nexus has turned into an unholy alliance, which is not just limited to India. In fact, he cites an example of how the Iraq war was started due to a fake tip by an informant. This truly lays bare the scale of destruction that can be caused due to a bad tip given by an unverified informant. There are a couple of paragraphs in the book that elaborate on this point, and I quote, Many informants have vested interests, either to earn a quick buck or tarnish a rival, sometimes even to deliberately mislead agencies. If information is not collected with such biases factored in, and not analyzed with academic rigor, the whole system could get muddled. This is what the world saw in 2003 when the US invaded Iraq. The US National Intelligence Estimate concluded that Iraq President Saddam Hussein was stockpiling chemical and biological weapons and was in league with the Al-Qaeda. This intelligence was used to persuade the Congress to authorize war and it formed the basis of the US Secretary of State Colin Powell's address to the United Nations in February 2003 arguing for the same. Later, it was found that the estimate relied on misleading or incorrect information 
much of it from a single source a chemical engineer who was last in his class and drove a taxi in Baghdad before fleeing Iraq because of theft cases against him Rafid Ahmed Alwan better known to the world as Curveball was probably an alcoholic was definitely a pathological liar and was playing the system he told the german and us intelligence operatives elaborate stories about how saddam's regime was building mobile weapons laboratories in march 2003 an international coalition led by the us invaded iraq based on his information it was an action that destabilized the country caused the deaths of over 200000 iraqi citizens and resulted in immense violence and cruelty stop quote despite being acquitted from his earlier case wahid was arrested again after the mumbai train blasts of 2006 after a few years in prison and a lot of torture he was eventually acquitted from that case too this whole process stole almost a decade from wahid's life despite that wahid did not lose optimism in the system to know more about his story do read the book coming to part 2 of the book many tales of india josi joseph takes us on a head spinning journey across the country he details out how india has chosen to tackle militancy in different parts of the country and even beyond from kashmir to punjab to even the ipkf blunder in sri lanka he even talks about the horrible treatment meted out to the kashmiri pandits in the valley by the militants and i'd like all of you to read the book and discover all of these things for yourselves the penultimate chapter of the book however is one that i do want to address in this review it's called our brutal existence and the reason i want to talk about this chapter because throughout this book up till that point we see governments ordering security agencies to carry out crimes against civilians citizens anyone who they may not like or for any other reason that seems to benefit them however in this chapter josie joseph tells us the story of a man named samdeep mohan vargis also known as sam because in his case the orders did not come from a government organization instead the orders came from a shady private company called jay polychem which had hired sam i won't go into too much detail but sam essentially found out certain irregularities in the company and spoke about them only to get into a weird kafkaesque world that jay polychem had designed for him this private company seemed to have access to an entire state's police force at its behest this state was the state of punjab and josie joseph uses this story to tell the long sordid history of punjab police's many crimes eventually josie joseph ends the book with a chapter titled the gujarat model in this chapter josie joseph talks about how the real gujarat model was very different from the one that was advertised to the country in the year 2014 Citing numerous examples he talks about the many encounter killings carried out by the Gujarat police under the then CM Narendra Modi in the chapter it is detailed out how an entire state's police machinery was used to build up the image and political career of one man no prizes for guessing who what sticks out in this chapter is truly a sign of things to come because under the current central government this gujarat model is soon becoming an india model as we saw in the arrest of the bhima korega protest or even the arrest of umar khalid by no means does josi joseph say that this is an invention of the bjp in fact a majority of this book talks about how it was under the congress rule that all these colonial laws were used to oppress the people of our country however the scale at which this is increasing is something truly worrisome in this review i have barely scratched the surface of all that this book reveals from the legacy of colonial laws to the numerous shadowy security agencies to the business that militancy has become on both sides of the law but that's enough from me and i'll let you read the book to find out more as i said at the beginning of this review i am not qualified to be reviewing this book to begin with so this is more of a heartfelt appreciation for this book because I feel this is one that every Indian should be reading especially it should be read by filmmakers or other people who like to glorify the police force the indian police force is hard working they go through a lot of issues but they desperately need reforms and i believe anyone who reads this book will agree with that if you've read this book and like our review then do like the video on youtube or rate us on spotify soundcloud stitcher or google podcasts this was episode 2 of aditya learn to read and i reviewed josie joseph's the silent coup this is a new book review podcast by discontent and if you're liking the show do consider subscribing to us on youtube or following us on spotify stitcher soundcloud or google podcasts And if you're really liking what we do then you can choose to support us on our buy me a coffee page or via our YouTube memberships. Thank you very much for listening and I'll see you next week.